Well, thank you all for coming after what I'm sure has been a long, hard day's work. And thank you so much to Bill Dutton, the Austrian Internet Institute, our, our host here for this marvelous, amazing setting, which is a tough competition, I think, for any speaker. Um, and to the Society for Computers of Law, I thank you all so much for the honor of the invitation. Uh, today's talk starts with a fact that seems to dominate a lot of what I've been seeing on the internet for 15 years. And that is that two predictive narratives describe the likely social consequences of the internet for civil liberties and for economic growth. These narratives share an awful lot of features. They look at pretty much the same things, but they reach largely inimical conclusions. One, which I decided to call the cypherpunk dream, sees a decentralized, geodesic future saved perhaps from dangerous anarchy by the creation of a degree of spontaneously generated anarcho-capitalist order. The antithetical account, which I've called data's empire, envisions a utopia, or perhaps it's a hell, of ordered information and highly ordered liberty. Now I offer you these stories today not just to warn or even to titillate, although I'm above neither. Rather, I've got instrumental purposes. The first, in the spirit of Carl Llewellyn's famous discussion of dueling canons of statutory interpretation, is to suggest that for almost every plausible exercise of internet futurism, there is an equal and opposite and also plausible counter vision. An interesting property of these opposing visions is that some of the people forecasting each of them do so joyfully, while others do so in quaking terror. Another commonality is that sometimes internet visionaries slide into the tempting arms of what I'm going to call technological determinism. The thinking that somehow if something is built, it immediately leads to definable social consequences which can't be stopped. I'm going to argue that we should try to avoid what I think is a great fallacy of that kind. Now my second theme about that is perhaps a little more ivory tower, but it turns out to have political payoff. And that is to suggest that by juxtaposing these themes, we find some common elements of concern and also that in trying to get away from this terribly unsatisfying clash, we can find, if not a whole third way, then at least some lights that might guide us out of this morass and some maxims to think about as we look at these terribly important issues. So here we go. Let me first set out what I call the cypherpunk dream. It focuses on two core technologies which I'm sure many people in this audience are familiar. They are TCP IP, which is the fundamental packetizing of information on the internet. And I'm not going to spend much time on that because I assume we know about that. And also on very strong cryptography. Now, these technologies working together, the ability to keep information private or secret and the ability to send it in ways which are very difficult to stop, have in the eyes of the cypherpunk dreamers some strong libertarian consequences. They empower users against people who would prevent them from doing what users want, be they governments, older sisters, parents, corporations, whoever it might be. They enhance democracy because they make people truly free. They make in innovation easier and more distributed. And they weaken states. And of course, to the cypherpunks, that's a plus, not a minus. TCP IP, by packet switching, means the root independence of information makes it very tough for censors. We all know all about this. It's become a, a cliche that the net treats censorship as damage and roots around it. That was once a scary idea. Now it's a norm. Interestingly, by the way, it's probably less true today than it's been in certainly the last 10, 15 years because now we truly do have something of an information superhighway. And there are some routes that packets most commonly take that are big fat pipes that people come to rely on. So although this architectural property of the internet still remains latent, it's not, in fact, as true as it used to be, but people don't like to talk about that, especially cypherpunks, because it makes them very uncomfortable. Now, I mentioned strong cryptography. I've really got to emphasize just how strong it can be, and in particular, this concept of public-private key cryptography, which may be unfamiliar to some. I'm sure you all know about you know, simple ciphers, where you just encode something and you do the reverse function to decode it. That's not what this is about. This stuff works almost like magic. And I'm not going to try to do the math here, because um, I can never do it without a crib book open anyway. But the fundamental properties are really fascinating and powerful. When you properly ha work the algorithms, you generate a pair of keys rather than one key that's used to encrypt and decrypt. And one of the keys has the property that anything encrypted with the other can be read only by the first key and vice versa. So if I give you one key, or if I publish one key and I keep one secret, then 
anything that's sent to me using my public key, only I can read. And if I've got your public key, I can send you things only you can read. This is, this is actually the foundational technology for a great deal of digital signature and electronic commerce technology because these same principles allow us to uniquely identify senders. They allow us to authenticate information. It's a powerful and ubiquitous technology, but it's also one that has, if deployed in particular ways, and, and that's a very big if because it's easy to get wrong, but if deployed in particular ways, it has very strong privacy potential. Well, the cypherpunks, and by the way, the cypherpunks were a real group. It was a mailing list. I was a member of it. it was, my virus filters never worked so hard um, because the yeah, cypherpunks idea of a good time was to send out the latest piece of code they'd written and see what you did with it. Um, but it was a real group, and it was full of people who were radical libertarians and coders and thought they were going to change the world. And they thought this because they were dealing in the basics of information movement. And they believe and they understood that getting information is a form of power. And the more you make information available, the more you lower the transactions cost of information, the easier it is to participate in civic and political affairs. The scientists around the world will be on an equal footing if we all have access to electronic databases and journals. And as, we, as TCP IP makes it easy for groups to form online because the cost is so low, groups will form spontaneously, is the thinking. And this will be a wonderful thing. And indeed, we've seen that. But we've also seen the downsides. So on the one hand, you have what I call diasporic linguistic communities. You have people who migrate. Now they keep in much better touch with the home country. First it was through email. Now it's through um, recordings, YouTube, TV, whatever it might be. So the ties that bind are linguistically and culturally strengthened by this communication. People who have unusual hobbies. I give you here the example of butterfly fanciers. You may not know anybody in your town who fancies butterflies like you do, but now you can find hundreds of butterfly fanciers around the world and talk about your hobby and share your interests. Unfortunately, this is also true for Nazis. So you get both the good and the bad. Empowerment is an equal opportunity phenomenon. Well, it turns out that it's not just receiving information that's a form of power, it's also giving it. Everybody's a publisher, right? That's, that's one of the internet cliches now. We all have a, you know, a megaphone that's potentially equally loud. You know, bloggers have become a, a cliche. People who start their, the electronic equivalent of their own you know, newspaper, me journal, or whatever it might be, and some of whom get literally millions of readers every day. Meanwhile, newspapers appear to be dying on the vine. So you know, giving information is power, but it's not simply the megaphone kind of power, because the kind of power that comes with giving information is the ability to turn off the spigot as well as turn it on. So to the extent that you can control your self-presentation, self this becomes very important. Now that can be done, now that has a number of different aspects. One of those aspects is creating an anonymous um, identities, excuse me, pseudonymous identities. Another is perhaps an online avatar. If you play World of Warcraft or Second Life or whatever it might be, um, you might have multiple identities. And the, also the ability to ask questions without having to give your name. It, um, again, this is probably old news for many of you in the audience, but the classic examples were public health issues, right, where people might be afraid to ask a question about a sexually transmitted disease or sexual orientation or perhaps something they've done which they're concerned about the consequences if they thought it would come back to them. Um, anonymity and pseudonymity make that a lot more possible. These technologies also create helpful intermediaries, and cypherpunks were big in creating some of these helpful intermediaries. One of them was what they called the anonymous remailer. You didn't have the technology to send an anonymous message to somebody because your ISP required you to identify yourself. Just send off a message to your friendly, helpful third party who will strip off all the identifying information and forward it to the recipient you pick. Now this had a couple problems. I mean, one is what if the recipient you picked is a public official and it's a death threat? somebody comes asking questions. Another is you really have to trust the intermediary, or at least unless you do something complicated involving lots of intermediaries, you, you have to trust the intermediary. I often thought you could write a great novel about somebody who set up one of these things, kept all the messages for three years, and then started a blackmail operation. Now it turns out there are technical tricks you can use to avoid those problems, but they take a lot of work. Um, and generally speaking, those networks which were once flourishing are much less flourishing than they used to be because people have used them to send spam. It turned out that what brought down the anonymous remailer network was not death threats to presidents or prime ministers, but ads for Viagra. Other things, file sharing, right? Peer-to-peer -peer networks. 
enabled by, again, by TCP IP. Attorney servers, ways of putting out information into networks which pledge never to de destroy the copies. So the images are either so widely distributed or moving around so much that they can never be deleted. Um, WikiLeaks is a more static version of that, right? It's a website run by people who say, send us secret documents and we'll happily publish them so that the world can see them if you don't think they should be secret. Basically, the idea is everybody can be a helper. If you've got cycles and a, and a little bit of a space in your disk to help, plug into our network, the cypherpunks will send you a tool, and the next thing you are is you're helping messages get from one place to, to the next without having any idea what they are, perhaps, or what they're doing. Now, this means that information becomes tough to erase, and this has led to things known as the Barbara Streisand effect, named after a famous case in which the Barbara Streisand attempted to prevent publication of photos of her home online, causing everyone gleefully on the internet to publish the photos. See, this is what Barbara Streisand doesn't want you to see, and leading to far more publicity for the location and look of her home than she ever would have had if she just accepted having a part of the same aerial survey as every other coastal home in California. Um, a related phenomenon is one you had here in this country very recently, which I'm probably going to mangle the pr pronunciation, but the Trafigura affair in which a company attempted to get an injunction against the publication of a fact which became extremely well known very quickly and raised it from something rather obscure to something headline worthy, probably the worst piece of public relation advice of the decade. Well, so the cypherpunks also believed that what they were building were democracy enhancers. Um, in particular, not just the publication of secrets, but something that make life tough for despots. Right, so you'd have informa expatriate information sources going into the country from foreign-based web services, and you have information coming out of the country. And we've seen lots of interesting examples of that just in the past year with Twitter and YouTube, for example, from Iranian dissidents. Um, and you pick any year on the calendar in the last decade, and there'll have been something of this kind in which people are getting the message out in the face of otherwise effective censorship. It's been a very powerful tool. Interestingly, there's also been a lot of behind-the-scenes work with people providing strong cryptological tools to resistance movements in authoritarian countries, particularly in Central and South America. Um, a man named Patrick Ball at the American uh, Association for the Advancement of Science for many years was teaching civil society groups how to encrypt their databases so if their offices got raided and their computers got taken, membership list didn't suddenly below, you know, become available. Indeed, sometimes how to encrypt them with passphrases unknown to the people. They had to call somebody in a different country just to unlock their own computer. So that if they were in jail, they couldn't even be beat, the information couldn't even be beat out of them if they wanted to tell it. Um, similarly, um, giving them tools for, for, for encrypted communications among themselves to make wiretapping more difficult. There are lots and lots of anecdotes about how internet and repression don't mix. What's new now is some people, including people I think at Oxford, um, have been doing work really trying to do systematic studies of this and finding powerful, statistically significant correlations between what they call gently political instability um, in authoritarian regimes and the penetration of internet and to a lesser degree the penetration of cell phones. Interestingly, the internet effect right now is more pronounced than the cell phone effect, which was perhaps not entirely intuitive. Coming back home, another part of the story was it was going to, these technologies were going to transform the economy into something they like to call geodesic, I think, because it sounded nice. And the idea was that instead of having major transaction, consumer transaction flows, and also, in some case, service uh, provider transaction flows, flow through large intermediaries, instead we'd have peer-to-peer -peer transactions and that the more efficient market would lower prices and increase consumer choice. And we see tons of examples of this today, the, the death of the travel agent, people buy the, buying their um, flights increasingly directly online from the supplier. eBay, in which people sell peer-to-peer -peer with the help, admittedly, of an intermediary who provides a location. Web-based commodity markets, when I wanted to get some web design done, I actually invited people, I described the service I wanted on exchange, and people actually bid on it. And the work was eventually done by somebody. I have no idea who they were or where they were. They just described what they would do. Um, the money was put in escrow. They did the work. They got the money. It was great. And far less than I ever would have paid if I'd gone to any of the university suppliers. Um, many other examples of this, I think, for time. I'll probably skip over them. But um, some types of digital cash had these properties. Um, Web-based 
sales hit sometimes. And of course, you get these wonderful new intermediaries, which are designed not to sell to you, but to help you decide where to buy. So you get web-based comparison services, which try to go out and find you the lowest prices, shop bots, we used to call them. Now you might say, well, it's a lovely story, but why does it matter so much? And the answer the cypherpunks would tell you, and in here they're, they're probably right, is that it threatens to shift power from the center to the edges. And if the move really is as radical as Gutenberg's printing press, and it probably is, that means we're going to have happy but diffuse winners and unhappy but powerful and centralized losers. And whenever you have that situation, something, some sort of conflict tends to happen. Um, because the losers are, tend to be people who have been making money or uh, enjoying power based on the current system. And when something looks like it might change that, even if it isn't really going to do so, if it just looks like it might threaten it, they tend to do something in reaction. Um, they don't take it sitting still. As we'll see, in fact, they had good reasons to feel that way. The geodesic economy undermines a lot of regulation. Regulation cypherpunks might not like, but the rest of us might think we like quite a great deal. So for example, the statement that national boundaries are only speed bumps on the information superhighway sounded great to the anarcho-capitalist libertarians, but may sound quite terrifying to the rest of us. Um, the peer-to-peer -peer versus traditional model makes it harder to impose all sorts of regulations on the transactions. Not impossible, but more difficult, and certainly requires changes in how one regulates. And it does create a significant potential for fraud. Um, and I don't mean here just a simple fraud if someone says they're going to sell you something and then it never turns up. I mean much more sophisticated and interesting fraud like insider trading, because after all, if you can transact anonymously, <laughs> how do we show you're an insider? Sports gambling, the, the sports gambling people live in complete terror that the players on a, uh, a team will make bets about the game, and if they can truly disguise their identity, then they, it's much more um, simple for them, or at least much more practical for them, to shave a point here or there, or even throw the game, and perhaps not get caught. Um, the constraint on that, I might add, is that the money's, they've got to try to get their hands on the money at some point. And because the digital cash system has not been well deployed, in part because of very successful blockages by central bankers, one of whom said that what he allowed over his dead body, um, there's still quite a lot for the, the financial crimes people uh, to deal with. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, certainly, though, it means that when you're engaged in commerce with distant parties whom you don't know who they are, you need something to tell you why you should do it, either money held in escrow by a third person or reputation and trust systems. Now, the cheerful, happy part of the Cypherfunk story for anybody is that by empowering all these people, by having um, open source and free software, by having techniques that allow lots of people to collaborate, we unleashed a lot of creativity and innovation. And there's no question, if you think about the amount of software you can download for free today on the internet to do all sorts of wonderful things, from browsers to plugins to games to very useful applications, um, it's undeniable that an enormous amount of creativity has been unleashed and made available to people at, at, at zero cost or very low prices. Um, and it became part of the idea of this movement, really, that open code should be freely and publicly available in order to make innovation easy, and also so that you would know what your machine was doing to you, because the, the person should be the master, not the machine. And indeed, in the, the, by free, they really meant in the sense of free to see, and we're agnostic on the question whether it should be paid for. Um, examples of this include the copyleft license, which is a viral license term, which I think I'll leave for the questions. Um, there are obvious difficulties with the business model. Um, if you're giving something away, even you, very tough to make it up on volume. But it turns out you can sometimes make it up either on the reputation you earn from your first free thing, and somebody pays you to do the next one, or by people will pay you to um, help make it work or to ensure its reliability. The state aspect of this um, is that states seem to get weaker because they become vulnerable to regulatory arbitrage. It becomes possible to do your transaction or to do whatever you want in the, in the state next door, which might have rules you find more favorable, but which the, perhaps your regular didn't want to have those rules for some public policy purpose. Um, now, this obviously works easiest for digital goods, but also works quite well, it turns out, for a large number of services that don't require personal contact. That includes, by the way, the provision of legal services. Um, and works particularly well for some kinds of the kinds of politics that turn on communication. Um, interestingly, 
Some people have suggested that the ease of communication might make people more willing to vote with their feet because you still be able to keep some of the things from home you like. You keep in touch with people, you keep in touch with the culture, and so on. And some people suggested that not only would this end the isolation of the third world because they'd have contact with all the um, first and second worlds, uh, institutions of higher learning, businesses, and all the rest of it, but that you might get reverse brain drain in which people would go home because now they, the things for which they had left home would be available as home at well, as well. I don't know we've seen enormous signs of that, but that was certainly the prediction that was part of the dream. Um, we have seen the jealousy effect. Right? As people learn more about what's available elsewhere, this creates pressure on regulators. And the classic example of this is surely from my home country, where the existence of much lower pharmaceutical prices in Canada has driven lots and lots of people to try to buy drugs online, even though this is largely illegal. Um, because the savings are so enormous. Perhaps if we get health care reform, that will change, but I would not hold your breath. So the hardcore dream, death of all the things that the libertarians don't like. Secrets, including trade secrets. Somebody once wrote out a, pro a, propos a proposed black net, which would be a way to spill your employer's trade secrets and be secretly paid for it without it ever being traced to you. Death of taxes, because you go and have, earn your income um, in places which decided not to tax it for you, in tax havens. Uh, you'd be paid in anonymous e-cash. Again, this was a dream. It didn't, didn't really happen for most people. Um, and you'd hold your assets in offshore tax and data havens and be safe from all those annoying regulators. Um, and the idea was that the powers of what they called law enforcement agencies and three-letter agencies would therefore shrink because major parts of financial and political life would be camouflaged from them. Now, who believes this stuff? Right? There's a crazy story, right? Well, no. It wasn't just the cypherpunks. It turns out that major governments around the world actually got quite concerned about this story. Um, certainly in the United States, the FBI got very seriously worried about this. And when one hears that other three-letter agencies got concerned as well, if you look at legislative responses, you'll see a number of countries here. I think Australia probably led the way. Um, legislated quite a lot of things to try to make sure that the cypherpunk vision could not come into being. Um, more recently, we've seen France, I'll talk about this in a minute, some legislative attempts to protect at least certain business models from the cypherpunk incursion. And there's no question that dictators and authoritarians around the world got very concerned about this as well and took all kinds of measures to try to control what they saw either as cultural imperialism if it came from abroad or sedition if it came from at home. Um, and they responded with different sorts of rules, some of which were designed to keep out foreign influence, the so-called Great Firewall of China, and other cases to try to control what happened internally. Now, when I say who believes this stuff, it's important to understand that there's different kinds of belief here. Some people believed it because they thought it was great. Some people believed it was going to happen and thought it was terrible. Um, and those people thought we ought to, the people who believed it but thought it was terrible thought we can't let this happen. We've got to do something to stop it. And they came up with a counter vision of how the internet might be encouraged to develop and how interactions with people through the internet might be encouraged to develop, which I'm calling a counter vision. And that's data's empire. And here, too, we see some of the same core technologies, right? TCP and crypto are motivations for thinking about what can be done to remove what are seen as the most dangerous consequences of these technologies. And the way you do that is by bringing on some other things and throwing them into the mix. In particular, centralizing traffic devices, be it having a fixed and um, traceable and eavesdroppable number of pipes at your border, um, having a limited backbone so that message traffic becomes centralized and therefore easy to shape or intercept or um, observe, putting rules that constrain the behavior of portals or ISPs so that they become agents responsible either for following state rules or for informing on their customers or perhaps for denying certain classes of services to their customers, and also rules about the last mile because if you can control the switch, you control what goes down the switch. Another piece of this, and here we get a little bit away from the internet, but not so much because all these devices are usually connected to the internet, are uh, ubiquitous sensors. I speak, I know, here in a country which is the world leader in cameras and probably in the part of town which is probably the, world, the, the, the country's leader in cameras. Um, there's, of course, a camera here in this room, but that's a slightly different thing. Um, cameras and the, what's important about the cameras is not just the cameras, but what they're connected to and how long the tapes are saved and what happens when, as everyone keeps predicting, any minute now, 
we're going to get really good at facial recognition software and start indexing all the pictures in order to produce dossiers of who went where when, who they were near, who they met with, what happened. These have obviously valuable crime fighting purposes in a democracy, but they also have obviously valuable repressive purposes in, in undemocratic states. Throw in some biometrics to help us distinguish people and to prove people were where we say they were, and life gets really interesting um, in new and different ways. Um, and of course, the critical thing, again, is not the fact that the sensor sense, but that the databases keep the information and that the information is indexed in ways that make it easy to use. So information is power. But who's power? And here's where we really see how the two visions sort of are almost mirrors of each other. In the cypherpunk vision, we have everyone's a publisher. In Data's empire, we say, that's great. The more you publish, the more we can data mine you. The more we know about you, the more we can make connections, and the more, in fact, you reveal yourself, even if you don't mean to, by your writing style habits, information you leak about yourselves. I have a friend who tells me, give me three pieces of information about an anonymous identity, and I'll tell you who it is. The cypherpunks say there'll be civic part more civic participation. In Data's empire, they say, yes, but you must understand that we'll have real-time monitoring in order to preserve state security and public safety and, and welfare. The cypherpunks say, we're going to have world science, and everyone will be able to participate in the conversation. In Data's Empire, as I say, you know, we're not so sure that's great because what that produces is science fads, and everybody starts working on one problem because it's the hot problem at the moment. If when we had things a little more balkanized, sometimes you got great discoveries from people who were forced to think differently because they weren't plugged into the main model. Maybe this might actually impede science. There are no plans to do anything about that, but it's something they worry about. Cypherpunks laud easy group formation. In Data's Empire, they say, well, you create what groups you like, but we're going to make sure there's certain special kinds of centralization because we need that for regulatory purposes. Um, what's more, we'd like to say data's empire, you can talk all you like about diasporic communities, but the reality is going to be that some languages are going to predominate on the internet of the future, and those languages they usually say will be English and Chinese. Um, you may have lots and lots of groups forming, but in fact there's going to be, they suggest, media concentration. Um, and while it's great to say that people can go and say whatever they like, there's certain kinds of things they say that are really hateful and dangerous, and perhaps we ought to have rules to constrain hate speech. Information may want to be free, but information also needs to be paid for. So what rules? The cypherpunks want us to talk about anonymity and pseudonymity and the joys of it. In Data's empire, those are seen as quite threatening things because they enable people to do bad things and indeed remove ordinary social controls which constrain people in ordinary human interaction when people actually have some accountability and responsibility for what they do. And the idea is to try to put some of that back so that people will behave better instead of behaving worse. Um, and there are lots of technologies that you know, get invoked as possible ways of doing this. Uh, access requirements where you have to identify yourself to get online, the so-called internet driver's license, Controls on cryptography, so that there's a back door built in which makes decryption easier in case of need. Um, watermarks and tags on various sorts of documents in order that we can trace the trail of ownership so that if little copies are made, we can go back to the original person and send them a bill. Um, and, you know, cypherpunks may want to talk about eternity servers to, to prevent something from being deleted that someone might wish to suppress. In Data's empire, the real interest is actually to achieve that result in a different kind of way by having um, requirements that ISPs or other intermediaries keep copies of either all or part of messages sent through their services so that in the event that the police or other security services need to figure out who did something bad later, that information is available to them. Now, I thought I would try to concretize this with a new situation. Virtual worlds, places like World of Warcraft or Second Life, um, are sort of the new hot um, research subject in the academic circles in which I travel. So I said to myself, how do these ideas apply to virtual worlds? Um, and it's interesting, I think the cypherpunks would say, and I, I have to, here I have to confess I'm making this up because the cypherpunks list is now defunct, so I'm just channeling my inner cypherpunk here, um, would say, oh, you know, virtual worlds, fun and games. In Dunit's empire, they say, this is a large and important unregulated space. That could be a problem. The cypherpunks would say, you know, online avatars are good. You pretend to be who you like, you experiment, you increase human flourishing, um, you, you can do things, you know, and learn things and, and you know, start over, and this is all a great thing. Um, in Data's Empire, they say, you know, when people try to pretend to be something they're not, 
they get the information what those people are like from sources which are very stereotyped. And they present as stereotypes. And therefore all they do is reinforce stereotypes because other people who see them, a man say pretending to be a woman, presenting as a stereotype woman, this reinforces stereotypes of what women are like and it's actually a bad thing because other people don't realize that they're dealing with a person who's not actually a woman. Um, and there's actually some serious writing which suggests that this is a genuine fact about people pretending to be what they're not. Whether it's a large social problem, I leave up to you. Um, virtual goods, cypherpunks would say, are great toys or forms of expressive identity. If I want to clothe my avatar in the Coca-Cola label because I think that's what I identify with, this is a harmless um, idiosyncrasy which ought to be, you know, if, if not treasured, at least accepted. Um, in Data's Empire, we say, you know, that's a trademark. That belongs to somebody. You can't just go ahead and do that. Um, and it gets even more exciting when people online form things they call corp corporations, as they do, and sell things they call stock, as they do, um, and don't for a minute think that securities laws might apply to that, even though the virtual currencies in which they are transacting turn out to be exchangeable for ordinary real-world currencies in out-of-game exchange markets, such as eBay. And indeed, some people have suggested that if not carefully watched, these technologies could lend themselves to money laundering, and that would be, of course, a thing that would be unwelcome in many quarters. So the fundamental difference, really, to summarize, is that the cypherpunks see the internet as a communicative medium and think we should use speech rules, particularly American-style First Amendment speech rules, as our regulatory stance towards it. Well, in Data's empire, the dominant idea is that the internet is facilitative of dangerous behavior, and at times we should be ready to use a crime control model. The cypherpunks say, and by the way, when we say speech rules, we mean libertarian speech rules. And in Data's Empire, they say, you know, that's fine for you, but we're not libertarians. So that's not very interesting. Now, it turns out that there are ideas about how to actualize the Data's Empire idea. And some of them are a little bit scary. I'm going to tell you about a few of them now. The first is to encourage the creation of choke points. Why? Because choke points make regulation possible. And the classic example of this is the banking and financial system. It is possible, it is in fact a fact, that banks and other financial service providers, such as credit card companies and so on, can be subject to a great deal of regulation. They have a lot to lose. They have fixed locations. Um, and it turns out that these can be used to regulate behaviors that regulators don't like. For example, in the United States, they've made it next to impossible for US-based credit card companies to transact with offshore gambling dens as an attempt to discourage the spread of illegal gambling, or what at least the states assert is illegal gambling, even though it's happening abroad. Um, there's an interesting question as to where the gambling occurs. The person doing it is in the states. If that's the relevant place, then it's illegal. The wagers are being administered abroad, or at least they say they're abroad, and sometimes they actually are. Um, and perhaps in the view, in, it's certainly not illegal there. So there's an interesting choice of law problem there. But nonetheless, um, rather than try to deal with that issue, they went straight for the regulatory jugular, jugular, and it was fairly effective. Internet service providers are another potential choke point. People don't, aren't, the internet isn't something that just grows in your backyard. You've got to contract with somebody for it. Um, those tend to be large targets. There's a, there's a limited number of them, and it's possible to subject them to various sorts of rules. Similarly, major software providers, and especially the providers of large popular operating systems, I don't want to name any names, but they've got a brand new product out recently. Um, you know, can be the targets of regulation. And in the crypto wars of over a decade ago, the US government showed just how it's done. By putting on strong export controls for strong cryptography, which would have required the foreign version, the export version, be really, quite frankly, crippled, they discouraged this unnamed manufacturer from putting it into any of their systems because they thought it would depress foreign sales, and they didn't also want to have two versions, domestic and foreign, which required twice as much maintenance and updating. So it was just simpler to have no crypto at all. And this gave the people who wanted easy eavesdropping on email at least 10 more years lease of life, um, because the tools were awkward and required an aftermarket installation. It was a very effective strategy, and there's no reason to believe it couldn't be repeated in other areas. Um, so other types of infrastructure um, software, present targets. And they're also what I call infrastructure enablers. Right? These are either standards bodies, um, trusted third parties, if we require them in a crypto regulatory regime. And again, ICANN here provides a model that some people think really deserves to be followed, in the sense that ICANN has got a lock on a key piece of the infrastructure, the domain name system, 
and has been able to leverage that control to, write, to require that all the people in the business write certain standard terms into their contracts. So you cannot buy a domain name in the GTLDs like .com without having to agree to a contract in which you agree to a binding form of something like arbitration if somebody else thinks you've infringed their trademark. That has nothing to do with whether the person selling you that name thinks it's a good idea or not. That's a requirement imposed on them by ICANN, which they must agree to in order to stay in the business. Well, so this does seem to have some potential cost for innovation, right? It makes open source more difficult. Um, you, to the extent we have concentration, we tend to get winner-take-all markets, which may be a function, may be a natural tendency of some markets subject to network effects anyway. The choke point policy just encourages something which might be happening uh, even without it. Um, and it makes life happy for proprietary systems. Proprietary systems, again, make great targets for regulation, but they also lock in customers. And that probably is bad for innovation in the long run. Um, standards become a way to regulate control of standards. Um, and so it can be done through software. It can be done through hardware. A consequence of all this is a new, important, aggressive role for the state. Right here, these new problems, they're transnational problems. States may not be able to solve them alone, but they can still club together. And they've been trying to do that um, through both through formal and informal transnational agreements. Um, in particular, we're seeing treaties. Um, the particularly interesting one that's on the drawing board at the moment is this, uh, the proposed and recently leaked anti-counterfeiting trade agreement, um, which for some reason governments don't particularly want to share with consumers at the moment. But allegedly, if we're to believe our Canadian colleagues who, who got a copy of it, um, it's the draft currently in, being considered by the relevant governments, including the US and Canadian governments, would require ISPs to proactively police their users, to look out for copyright violations by their users, and to basically apply something like the US DMCA notice and takedown provisions on users. And in one version that's been bandied about, might require them to turn off users who disobey. There's also been quite a bit of power given to new quasi-state bodies, such as the WTO and ICANN. These bodies are all each um, unique. They have different governance structures and different accountability structures. But the striking feature about them is they tend to be more distanced from legislators and legislatures than other administrative organs that have been sort of the, the feature of the administrative state in the last two generations. Another part of the uh, data's empire approach to dealing with what are seen as the evils, the dangers of the cypherpunk vision, are to invest in profiling, in databases, in algorithms designed to organize what are huge masses of information, um, and to ensure that communications are made and remain wiretap friendly. So in the United States, for example, we have CALEA. There are similar rules in Europe. ISPs are required to um, be wiretap friendly, to design equipment which makes it possible for large numbers of wiretaps to plug into their equipment at reasonably low cost, which is also, um, in the US version, at least paid for by the government. Um, and you get a secret surveillance infrastructure, which is extremely difficult for citizens to know if it's, how much it's being used or whether it's being abused. There's a lawsuit in the United States at the moment um, run by EFF. Somebody stumbled on a room in San Francisco, which appeared to be a large surveillance um, uh, facility plugged into one of the core uh, pieces of telephone and internet traffic in the United States. Um, and they therefore brought a lawsuit to try to get details of what was going on. This resulted, among other things, in Congress passing a special bill to kill the lawsuit. Clearly, somebody was concerned about something, although the details still remain more obscure than one would ideally like. But there's this, you know, these sorts of worries may sound a little paranoid, but it's really partly because we just don't know all the things that we might reasonably like to know. So the consequences of all this are a world of low privacy and high surveillance, um, better life for regulators, Imagine a worry of better or perhaps even perfect tax enforcement in which the tax authorities know about every transaction because it's part of the database and you just get your bill at the end of the year. If you're an American like me, it would certainly save on filling out the forms, which might be a good thing. But I suspect it might also increase a large number of tax bills, which might not make your clients as happy as it would make the IRS or the, the Inland Revenue. Um, and indeed, the prospect of better and perhaps even perfect law enforcement is one which may bring tears of joy or terror to different eyes, 
um, but speaking for the United States at least, where so many of our legal rules are draconian because it is alleged the interorum effect of the rule is more important than the enforcement. We know we can't get everybody, so we at least try to scare people straight. Imagine what happens if all of a sudden our enforcement capability goes way up. American politics being what it is, I don't think sentences will go down. And speaking as I do from a country which has got more people incarcerated per million than any other country in the world, I'm not sure the consequences of this are entirely cheerful, at least for my country. Well, this is all very depressing. Is there no way out of the swamp? Is there, is there no place where responsible, non-libertarian communitarians might go to find policy prescriptions? After all, there are things to dislike both about the cypherpunk dream and about data's empire. Um, and these are serious questions because these activities on the internet clearly have spillovers into the rest of our lives. It's not just that people are playing games in World of Warcraft, they're doing things with very real consequences for very real people, even when they're not connected. How should we deal with, or control, if you will, spillovers into what I fondly call meat space? Are there effective rules which will, res which will respect communitarian values, further the goals of existing law, not discourage innovation, keep the internet great? We'd like that. Um, I suggest to you that really the techniques of data's empire do not meet these tests. Is there nothing we can do? I think there are a few things we can do. I don't have a complete prescription for you, but I do have a number of maxims and the outlines, at least, of what something might look like, ambitious as it may be. And the first step is to understand that not all the issues are alike. We need to do some sorting. The first thing we have to ask ourselves as we look at a situation created by the internet which we feel needs some sort of public policy reaction is to ask ourselves if this is a genuinely new problem. Because a lot of internet problems really have old-fashioned solutions. They're just a law enforcement problem. It just happens that somebody's using a new tool. Sometimes the problem can be solved through self-organization of users, but sometimes it can't. And we have to build something new, but we need to figure out which is which. Sometimes we have a new venue for an old problem. Sometimes that means the old solution works. Sometimes a new venue makes the problem so much bigger that the old solution doesn't work. Um, so here are some examples. Here are a few gen what I think of as genuinely new issues raised by the internet. Right? One is this idea of cheap full-time tracking. Um, the destruction of the privacy commons, the interconnection of all the sensors through databases, pro the possibility that we'll be able to have strong profiling through search tracks, be it through Google or one of its competitors, through mouse clicks, through biometrics, through analysis of content you put online, your Twitter feed combined with your homepage, combined with your employer's file. And that all these data have ubiquity and persistence, and that is just as true of the falsehoods as it is of the accurate things. In the United States in the past four or five years, we've had a number of very high profile cases of really evil and false things said about people, turning up number one on the Google searches for them and causing them great personal grief, loss of employment, and ultimately in some cases, rather generous but private settlements from the perpetrators but it's very hard work to track them down sometimes, um, and some of them turn out not to have any money. And even, I'm sure, the victims would prefer to have had never happen than to have had the compensation. Um, now imagine the, you know, the cognate thing, which is the persistence of accurate, perhaps not terribly relevant facts. Um, we had students at the University of Miami who went for a drunken swim in the lake in the center of campus and posted some uh, pictures of themselves on Facebook or MySpace, I forget which, um, of them behaving in rather silly and unclothed manner. And um, employers found those, and they were not happy. Now you might say, that's great. Responsibility, accountability, all the rest of it. But it's certainly a change. It's something new. <coughs> Some more new issues. How do we manage non-commercial communities? Um, how do we foster them and keep them from becoming vulnerable to things like spam? to the various um, flame wars and all the things. If we're going to have groups of people who are not used to working with each other in a much narrow-banded medium um, in which miscommunication can happen so easily, we really need to think about how we're going to organize collaboration across cultures um, asynchronously um, and with very different kinds of people. Because as a, if we can solve those problems, we stand to benefit a great deal from the collaborations that result. I think it's a much harder problem than people generally credit having been a participant in these communities for a long time now, um, they really do seem to go through a life cycle. Um, and they're vulnerable to a number of familiar pathologies, none of which we figured out how to solve. 
Um, and if we could solve some of these, if we could have uh, training or, or tropes or habits that encourage people to behave in productive ways in groups, I think we'd all benefit enormously from that. Virtual worlds. Um, it's true that at the moment they mostly have primarily online problems. Um, but you know, there's this EVE Online where they had a, some guys running a bank, which turned out to be a fraud that in terms of the GDP of the, the entity dwarfed anything that's happened on Wall Street or around here. Um, people ran off with all the money, basically, and it was an enormous amount of money. For It was virtual money. Um, but imagine a virtual world which is more tightly linked with the cash economy, which we might well have someday, and imagine that the banking structures are designed to try to avoid regulation by being either mobile or claiming a fixed abode in a lightly regulated jurisdiction, the familiar race to the bottom problem, um, we may just be replicating the history of financial frauds, panics, and booms and all the rest of it. And why do we need to do that when we've learned how to do things better? I think we've learned how to do things better, have we? Um, actually, well, maybe not. Um, we can hope. There are also lots of genuinely old issues, which tend to be marketed as new issues because people want to, fit, to take advantage of the excuse of the internet to achieve some policy objective that they had even before the internet. So one is the cross-border sales problem. It's been truly puzzling to me to see all the discussions that have happened at transnational levels about the terrible problems of cross-border sales for the seller who needs to know where the buyer is in, or in order to protect himself from being subject to unpredictable rules, consumer law, and all the rest of it. Um, I would have thought this was a problem that reasonable people could have solved in five minutes with the following rule. If, if you're shipping a tangible good to an address, that's where you're entitled to assume the seller is. If you're shipping a virtual good or service to the seller, you ask them where they are, and they're stopped from denying it if they try to sue you. Now you have all the certainty you need. Can we get on with our lives? That's not the way the Hague Convention worked out. Um, and it, you know, I wasn't a participant, so there may have been things going on there I didn't understand. But from a great distance, at least, it seemed enormously puzzling um, and explainable, really explainable only because people were trying to achieve objectives which weren't actually about the internet problem, but about other problems. Now, jurisdiction choice of law can be very tough on the internet, no question about that, but they're fundamentally subject to the same legal principles um, as those problems are in tra complex transactions that don't happen to involve the internet. The tough parts are actually not figuring out what rule ought to apply, but once you've figured out what rule is applied, actually getting it applied, because when people go and uh, organize their transactions or happen to be in places where they're hard to get at, um, there can be tough problems in international cooperation. Some of those are being sorted out by treaty. The Cybercrime Treaty, for example, imposes lots of requirements on law enforcement agencies to cooperate and so on. Um, the police officers I speak to have <coughs> varying stories as to the actual effectiveness of these on the ground, which vary, I think, a lot with who they happen to deal with and in what countries. It's, it's unquestionable that it's not anywhere close to perfect at present. But that is fundamentally an implementational problem, it seems to me, rather than a theoretical one, which requires a wholesale change in how we think about the world. Well, what about conspiracy, right? Because this is, this is the thing that law enforcement and national security uh, entities, both in democratic and undemocratic countries, get very excited about. It seems to me that this is really fundamentally an old tension with only a slightly new balance. And indeed, that organizations trying to operate in secret are still as vulnerable to infiltration as they ever were. That cryptography turns out still, at present, maybe not in the future, to be rather difficult to implement properly and rather easy to implement poorly. And there's nothing better from the law enforcement perspective than people who think they're speaking in secret but aren't really. Just think about the Japanese in World War II. Money laundering and tax avoidance, um, it seems to me, are not yet internet particularly strong problems. Um, anonymous digital cash is not something that most people are willing to hold, and for good reasons, because it is not terribly trustworthy. Um, and indeed, rather the opposite is true. Um, to the extent that people might be capable of doing financial fraud online, when they try to re-enter the financial system, um, the authorities are really much, much better at smoking out um, strange financial transactions they are than at doing many other things in the law enforcement world. It's been very effective technology in the last decade. Now, trademarks is a special case, it seems to me, because the trademark people say, and I believe with some justice, much as it pains me to admit this, that the change in the, the size of the effect is so great as to make a, really a, a difference in kind. That where the trademark system was fundamentally built around the idea of geographic limits 
on the reach of a mark. And now the geographic boundaries are very substantially erased. They're primarily linguistic boundaries rather than geographic boundaries. And that's a completely different organizing principle from the one on which the international trademark system is based. And there I think we have not yet really totally come to terms with what that means and how to work that out. Um, so that's an old issue, but it's one in which the effects are so great as to practically maybe really make it a new issue. Many people want to say that e-government is a whole new internet thing. I mean, I think it's wonderful. I think it's useful. But it doesn't actually seem to me to be, uh, at a high level, to be a particularly new issue. It's really just harnessing technology to achieve goals that have not changed substantially from what they always were and probably shouldn't change. Right? The public law goals of citizen access, openness and transparency are valuable regardless of the technology, which changes the cost of delivering. It's gone down and it makes some things that wouldn't have been practical before practical. Um, but that's not a change in fundamentals, or at least I don't think it should be. So as we think about proposals for internet-related laws, here are some things to think about, right? Is this an old problem, a new problem, or is this piggybacking, somebody with an agenda trying to make an old problem look new to take advantage of the situation? Is this something which is best solved legally, or is it a technological solution? What's the nature of the kind of rule being proposed? Is it an enabling rule? a rule that allows people to protect themselves, or is it a disabling rule, a rule that makes it less easy for people to do something? Are we trying to encourage spontaneous order from forming, or are we using something under the cloak of private ordering and actually enforcing rules on people on a take it or leave it basis? And here's, I think, the most important question of all in looking at proposed rules. What are the side effects? And these, we need to look both at the domestic and the foreign effects. Now, domestically, in democracies, we have fairly worked out systems with interest groups and so on for looking at you know, how that works. But I think the foreign effects risk being systematically undervalued. Um, as we create controls which reduce the power of people to do things, this may have enormous side effects in less democratic and more authoritarian countries. Um, as we create access controls, monitoring, choke points, government enablers, we have very strong risks of making it easier for governments who are doing unpleasant things to their people to keep the lid on spontaneous and popular movements which are trying to get themselves more freedom. It's also important to understand that we're not talking here just about the access of information from abroad, but about internal movements. Right? The software that we build here, the rules, we, the standards we set here get exported and applied domestically in other countries. So it's very important to understand that rules that might make sense here in a country with a system of democratic checks on the abuse of power, and I'm going to assume that one party government in a parliamentary system does that, although certainly having lived here uh, in the Thatcher, post-Thatcher period, one, one wondered sometimes. But um, nevertheless, assume, you know, we can certainly say that it's not true of every country in the world, and we need to think about that. Um, so far, we've avoided the toughest choices. The strongest pressure to change, to make rules which disable people have come from national security claimants, both in democratic countries and in undemocratic countries, and from contents rights holders who want their business models protected against what they see as a fundamental threat. And um, you get the DMCA in the United States, the Hadopi three strikes law in France. Um, and we're going to get more claims like this from other groups soon, bans on hate speech, bans on spam, bans on fraud. Maybe a rights-based approach is the answer. But we have in front of us the so-called Finnish model of a right to internet access, where it's going to become a human right in Finland to have at least one megabyte broadband access. Um, the, United, the EU, meanwhile, seems to try to get the best of both worlds. It started out in a very, I would say, data's empire-ish kind of move with a data retention directive, which requires that internet intermediaries keep all sorts of information generated by their customers. We then had the privacy directive, which was not couched as a fundamental human right, but nonetheless had very important um, provisions, which are probably world leaders in most cases, um, trying to control how um, people subject to its rules use and especially reuse and store data. And now, just this last week or two, we see the so-called internet freedom provisions of the framework directive of the EU telecoms reform, inspired, it appears, by a need to counter rules such as the French Hadelpi law, which was going to cut off a family's broadband access on a three strikes principle. And here you've got all this little tiny type, um, but I bolded what I think are the most important pieces here, 
which says that um, when states make rules about electronic communications, they shall respect the fundamental rights and freedom of natural persons as guaranteed by the European Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms and General Principles of Community Law. This is actually fairly powerful stuff. It raises key issues to the highest level of salience. It makes the necessary conversations about what the rules should be much more likely as a result, because if you want to trump a right, you need something pretty strong to do that. Um, and it allows us perhaps to have those conversations before standards dominate the market and make our choices much more difficult, constrained, and expensive. They create actionable rights in states with strong and powerful courts. Of course, that's not always true. I always remember my parents telling me that the Soviet Constitution created the greatest rights in the world, only you couldn't possibly exercise them. Um, so, you know, it has to be more than a paper right. Um, and it creates international norms, which create a method of, per of perhaps pressuring countries that wouldn't otherwise be naturally disposed uh, to give full weight to those rights. But rights-based approaches also have limits. For one thing, the rights are subject to balancing and potentially to excessive balancing. I, I quoted you the EU language, I won't do it again. Even in the United States First Amendment, which is perhaps one of the most absolutist statements of a communicative freedom right in captivity, we find that right being balanced, but at least it's only against other rights as a general matter. Um, and also, it must be said, though, national security, which is, in a sense, everyone's right collectively, but a different kind of right um, from, from the kind of balance I was talking about before. The other thing is that rights can be very tough to enforce in the face of centralizing technology. Right? If you have that huge database just sitting there, it becomes a temptation. It becomes a temptation in moments of crises. Let's find all the people who are um, former nationals of the state with which we are currently feeling uncomfortable and find out where they live, just to have them on the list in case we need to know that they might be up to something bad. Um, it's, a tech, it's a temptation uh, when we come up with some new and interesting way to use the technology which might actually have positive effects. And violations, technological-based violations, are not always visible. Right? If nobody had opened that door in San Francisco, we would not probably have the faintest clue that something funny was going on there. The other thing is that rights-based approaches have a scope issue. They don't cover the waterfront. Right? The internet freedom provision that I was saying is such a wonderful thing, coming to you from the European Union, is about access to, or in fact really, a negative prohibition. It's about a prohibition against disabling access without due process and various protections. The Finnish right is a positive right, but again, it's just about access. There's much more involved here than just being able to plug in your computer. We need to consider the nature and quality of the experience. We need to consider the effect of choke points. We need to consider market structure. And all these things are going to have an effect on freedom and innovation. Privacy is particularly important. Again, just in the last few days, a really interesting and potentially important document. This one, non-governmental. The Madrid Privacy Declaration from November 3rd creates what it calls global privacy standards for a global world. It was signed by over 100 civil society organizations and privacy experts and calls for all kinds of good things I don't have room for on my slides. Here are just a few of the highlights. Fair information practices, pets, privacy enhancing technologies, the idea that um, people should have tools, a moratorium on development and implementation of systems of mass surveillance, and a new international framework for privacy protection. And that's only the highlights. So it seems to me what we need are rights plus. We not only need rights, we also need industrial policy which is sensitive to the ways in which technologies develop. We need competition law to encourage competition and prevent centralization, which leads to choke points. We need to be nervous about hardware and, and also software lock-in. We need to encourage the power of standards be used for openness and not for things where people can't tell what the machine is doing. We need user empowerment. And by this, I don't just mean legal rights. I mean tools. Tools at least have to be available. Not everybody has to use them, of course, but they need to at least be available. Tools that help people self-organize, tools that keep power on the edges rather than the center, tools which protect people, allow people to protect their own privacy rather than relying on someone else to protect it for them. And we need to resist the siren, the siren call of opportunistic choke point creation. There's an enormous amount at stake. If you're still sitting here after all this, I'm sure you know what it is. I will, I will not waste your time. Um, repeating what I said before, but rather I'll say this, one last idea. It's important to resist technological determinism. If nothing else, the overlaps between the two stories I started with suggest, I think, pretty strongly 
that information technologies are not deterministic. If a lot of smart people can look at them and come to completely different conclusions, that suggests that there's some openness, there's some play in the joints. And it seems to me, therefore, that what matters is not what technologies we invent so much as how we deploy the ones that we do invent. Standards and network effects have power, but they have power after the fact. And it's possible to foresee things and make changes in order to push things in the way we want to go. Early choices have big effects. So it's up to us to choose wisely and choose now before we're locked in and before it becomes much more expensive and difficult to change, before the different sets of winners and losers establish first movers with vested interests and no doubt revenues to go with them. After all, the golden eggs come from somewhere and we want more golden eggs. So thank you. I think uh, if, if we have a couple of questions, maybe if we had two or three questions, then we could ask Michael to field a, a I think set notes. of questions. I brought paper. OK. All right. If no one uh, wants to jump up. T uh, t uh, Tony Wales, please. Yes. Michael, thank you very much indeed. Uh, very stimulating. And uh, just like to maybe get you to expand a little bit more on one of the themes that you gave us, and that's the difference between libertarian and non-libertarian approach of the cypherpunks. Um, you gave the, uh, particularly the, the size of the threat of the uh, cypherpunks being um, enhancing democracy uh, in a way that everyone's a publisher, it gives everybody a chance to participate. If we take that as saying en enhancing democracy in a way that in general terms we think as a good thing within some sort of structure, either rule of law or sort of acknowledging that there are competing rights and having some respect for the structure, as opposed to, say, the, uh, I suggest, smaller number of, of cypherpunks who look not so much at enhancing democracy, but enhancing, say, anarchy, so the turning it around the other way, who just don't have any regard for any structure, any rule of law at all. Do you think you would be looking through a different prism if we just looked at the, the smaller group of the web anarchists rather than the web uh, Democrats? The question I have actually is you were talked about intermediaries and you talked about these choke points. And I see them coming up sort of in both visions that you discussed for the future of the internet. And I was just wondering what you see in your rights-based approach that you discussed as sort of the responsibilities of these gatekeepers. And I mean, do you kind of have a vision of how you see what these gatekeepers are? And I want to talk to you about data breach, I want to ask you about data breach provisions. Um, in the United States and California set the trend by instituting data breach provisions and followed by about 43 other states. Now in the e-privacy directive in, in, the, in the European Union, which you referred to, has data breach provisions to, uh, concerning online services and telecom sector. That is the requirement to inform the authorities if an organization has, has date, personal data lost or stolen. And my question is whether you are in favor of extending that provision to all sectors, having another directive or some other provision which extends those data breach requirements to other sectors. Well, those are all really great questions. I'll try to take them in turn. The first one was, um, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit here, wouldn't it be less of a false dichotomy to focus on e-government punks rather than cypherpunks as being more representative of some general trend? Um, and what happens when we look, when we take out the anarcho-capitalist piece of the story and look just at the friendly, cuddly, uh, democratic uh, enablers? Um, I have two, two answers to that, neither of which may be entirely satisfactory. One is as a sociological fact, the group that was the cypherpunks was heavily anarcho-capitalist, and the other group, they're not cypherpunks. They're communitarians um, and much cuddlier. Um, the, other thing, the other thing is it is an unfortunate fact about the technology that a packet is a packet is a packet. And you cannot, it turns out, you really, you literally cannot, it is not physically possible to make a rule that distinguishes between packets by content. So whatever rule we have for speech is going to be a rule for commerce, because of, for e-commerce, because a packet is a packet. We don't know if it's an, or, an order for a book from Amazon, seditious libel, death threat, the best poem ever written in the human language. We have no idea. We can do deep packet inspection and try to learn a lot about what's going on, but that has, that, then, we're, then we're doing it to everything. Um, so that it turns out that much as one would love to, uh, 
try to suggest that these rules have to be separate. They're in fact technologically mated in ways which are uncomfortable. Um, so they don't separate out of my mind nearly as much as one would wish that they would. Um, the next one was a wonderful question about intermediaries and choke points. And the, the part of the question I like best is what are the gatekeeper's duties? Um, now, that's a great question because I didn't actually address any of that in, in what I spoke about. And there was a reason why I didn't address that, which is that, again, two things. The first is that to the extent that the gatekeepers are private actors, ISPs or whatever, they, their incentives tend to be profit making. And therefore, the problem they face right now is they're being given duties that don't add to the bottom line, which serve some external regulatory interest like spy on your customers, keep all the data, all the rest of it. Um, which they wouldn't otherwise naturally do. They would keep records for some period of time in order to assure the functioning of the enterprise. But you know, data, keeping data forever and indexing it is a cost that they wouldn't otherwise pay. So that the, the public policy problem has been the imposition of requirements on them rather than their failure to act in some sort of responsible way. Now we could flip that around, of course. We could say, all right, we're going to have a system which is one we like better. And part of that, we want our intermediaries to behave well. And therefore, they will be regulated like everyone else and subject to data privacy law or whatever else it might be. And, and that, so my answer then would be their duties are really everyone's duties because we're all handling data at some point, except to the extent that it's data about ourselves that we keep to ourselves. And the last question was about data breach laws. Um, now, I've got to say that here, again, the, my own writing in data breach has been entirely concerned with, with data breaches from the public sector. So I speak to you just as, as a consumer and as a citizen, rather than someone who's done a systematic study of the issue, it does seem to me that data breach rules have a very valuable place to play in the general ecology of rules regulating information use and misuse. Um, they're not, for me as a citizen, the be all and end all. Um, there are other things that maybe happen to matter to me more personally, but I think they're a very valuable and good thing. It's been fascinating and cheerful to see them take the United States by storm, if somewhat mystifying as to why that as opposed to so many other things. If I could maybe as uh, chair, I'll take the advantage and, and maybe ask the, the last question, maybe two points, and maybe if we have time to respond. The, um, I think what's new is that the internet is now central to uh, uh, our, a central infrastructure. It's past the tipping point. Uh, many of these issues were around for a long time, but nobody really focused on it because the internet was something that academics used or was peripheral. But now 1.7 billion people around the world, a quarter of the world is online. 75% of uh, Britons are online 14 years old and over. 30% of them think it's absolutely essential to their life and, and way of doing things. So the centrality of the internet is new and that's why all of these issues are now becoming more central, even though there are some old issues. And then my other point would be, at some point, these ideologies do exist. The cyberpunks exist and others exist. But, but I think the more worrisome thing to me is not at, the, at these wars of worldviews, but in the details. That is, these are well-intentioned people trying to deal with real problems of, of, of protecting people from defamation or trying to protect music or trying to uh, uh, prevent hate speech or trying to protect children from unwanted uh, images and so forth. So they're trying to deal, and I think it's grappling with these uh, specific issues in specific contexts that we're creating the biggest threat to the, the traditional freedoms of the internet. And I think until we get down into the sort of detailed ecology of these issues, I, don't, I, I worry that we won't be able to deal with it at the broad level. Well, I love the idea that we can now speak of the traditional freedoms of the internet. Um, although I'm old enough to remember a time when the internet you know, basically didn't exist, so I, uh, I don't know what that makes me, Methuselah. Um, OK, it's two points. The first is that what's new is that the net is seen as a central infrastructure. It's got new scale and scope, and that's what it's, it's the fact that it's seen as essential is what, what matters. There's a lot of truth there. Just a matter of free association, I just want to report to you that as you said that, what flashed into my head is all the things I know about how rickety the internet still is. So that a piece which, which maybe I need to think about more, actually, is, is, is another dimension of this, which is that a lot of this stuff is bailing wires and string. <laughs> 
Um, and we don't, we don't have enough robust, I mean, we, we're connecting hospitals, we're doing patient information on this stuff. I mean, in, and there, there are lots of ways in which it can break. I mean, I once sponsored a panel discussion at CFP on how to kill the internet. Um, and got three computer scientists in, each of whom had one scheme more gruesome than the next. And the simplest one was, said, give me six backhoes, you know, at precise locations. Um, you know, now it's maybe 12, but still. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, it's still, I mean, it's not a big number. Um, now, your other point is obviously correct, that, that details matter. But I think I'm thrilled that you got that message for when I said it, that made you think of that, because this shows you the strength in some ways of, of two things which I'm trying to say. The first is that conversations need to be broadened. Because as we think about details, we can get tunnel vision, and we need to think about the side effects. And the other is this is actually one of the strengths of rights-based visions. Because so often we're tempted to do something because it seems good now. And what rights-based approaches tell us is, well, you still can't do that, even though it would do good now, because we have some more fundamental commitment that it may threaten. So that seems to me to demonstrate the strength of the rights approach. Okay, I think we, sh uh, we should call it to a close because I know it's late. And, uh, but you did say you might be paranoid and it just, I can't go away without saying that just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you, right? I, so <laughs> uh, the, the person I heard is that the people out there who like to go out and get paranoid. <laughs> so let's, let's thank our speaker and thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you all so much.